This is Jesus, born into poverty in an insignificant corner of a conquered nation. This is Jesus, a traveling preacher, a homeless outcast called crazy and possessed. This is Jesus, another hopeless rebel, mocked and beaten, hung on a cross to die. This is Jesus, another lifeless body, stuffed into a borrowed tomb, soon to be forgotten. Is this really Jesus? Wake up. Wake up, O oh sleeper, and rise from the dead. This is Jesus, sent by the Father to be crushed for the sins of the world. This is Jesus, declaring to all he would be killed and then raised to life on the third day. This is Jesus, healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead. This is Jesus, a missing body from an empty tomb on a Sunday morning. This is Jesus, the image of invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, the Lamb of God, the light of the world. This is Jesus, Savior, Lord, King, Alpha, Omega, Creator, Redeemer, Friend to Sinners, Hope of Nations, the Messiah. This is Jesus, the resurrection and the life for all who trust in Him. Wake up, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead. This is Jesus. Till I walk streets of gold 
speed of life. 
out in faith We'll crush disappointments and break every chain And all of my fear I will turn into praise Shake up the spirit as I sing out your name A victory dance, I will dance out in faith I will crush disappointment and break every chain And all of my fear I will turn into praise Shake up the spirit as I sing out your name
I want to welcome everybody. I'm so happy that you're with us. My name is Pastor Dennis Boudreau from Victory Impact Center here in Port McNichol. I love the Word of God. So we're starting a new series today. Hallelujah. It's called the Treasures of the Psalm series. Hallelujah. And we're going to start at Psalm 1, but it's just something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and I really felt today would be a good start. It just seems to be running in my spirit. I want to preach about the Psalms. I want to talk about the Psalms. And so here we are, and we're going to start, like I said, Psalm 1, uh, verses 1 to 6. It's a short psalm, but it's actually a very, I'll say it like this. It's it's a psalm to start off the other psalms. Hallelujah. And um, some of the scholars were saying that Psalm 23 was the first one that David ever wrote. Anyway, somehow this one ended up being in the first chapter. Uh, let's see what it says. It's about the way of the righteous and the end of the ungodly. And I pondered about that. It's basically a psalm about right choices and having fruit that go along with it. We're going to break it down and then we're going to talk about the psalms. And then we're going to just go from there. So I really hope and pray that you receive something from here. Because psalms are writings from many people, mostly David. At least half of them are on David. People have quoted them. So Psalm 1, 1 to 6, it says, it starts off with, Blessed is the man. Hallelujah. But he, there's a reason why you're blessed. Because you're the one who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Now let's go back here. Blessed a man who walks not in a council. He's talking about men who walk and have counsel with ungodly men. Advice from ungodly men. Or taking advisement from people who don't know the Lord. It's about walking in this way. And it also means about standing. Nor stands, it says here. That means to take a stand, to be steadfast, established, be a servant of, like a soldier standing ready for command, but not from the ungodly, not taking the command. It's like there's two camps before us. And he's saying, I don't want you walking with these guys. If you want to be blessed, you don't walk with these guys. You don't stand, be steadfast with them, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, which means to remain, to dwell to inhabit or abide. He's saying we must be separate from them if we are going to be blessed. Hallelujah. What a way to start. David the psalmist warns us not to walk, not to stand, and to sit with ungodly sinners. Wow. Like it is clear cut. That for us as believers is a call for repentance. Let me explain why. Because there are times we take a stand. If we're not strong, if we're in a weak time in our walk, we will take stand sometimes or we'll sit or we'll take advice from the ungodly, the people who don't know the Lord, who don't know the wisdom of God's word. So I got to say right off the bat, way to go, David. Way to go to start off the book of Psalms here. Oh, that's awesome. Now, verse 2 says it's the opposite. Okay, so he says, Blessed is a man who walks not or doesn't sit or doesn't stand with the ungodly. The ones that don't know God and don't want to know God. But he goes, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. I want to take a look at that shortly, but just, just hang on. We're going to read the six verses first. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand. They got nothing to stand on when it comes to judgment time. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. In other words, there's going to be a separation. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. I just love the fact that the Lord knows. The Lord knows, folks. He knows everything. Nothing is hidden from him. So the, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, 
but the way of the ungodly shall perish. He knows both ways. Now, here's a question. How many of you enjoy the feeling you get when you come into a warm house after being out in the cold for a while? And you know, you come in and you're, you're cold and you're saying, oh, it's cold out there. I should have been in a long time, but I'm cold right down to the bones. I mean, think about it for a moment. You're outside and your hands and your feet are, are getting to a very uncomfortable place. Your nose is beginning to leak and Jack Frost is nipping at your nose. That's when wisdom kicks in and tells you it's time to go in and thaw that frozen beard or mustache or whatever it is that's frozen on you. Okay, sometimes it's so cold that your eyelashes get full of frost. You know, maybe you've had some of those masks on and the steam goes up and it's that cold outside. You've been out for a while. You notice that feeling. And the moment you walk in, into the heat of the home, you say to yourself, Nutters, oh yeah, it is so nice and toasty in this place. And you know, you get your, take your mittens and your, everything off and you just get near the fire or get near a, somewhere where it's nice and warm. What an awesome feeling it is for your hands and your feet, your nose and your ears to begin that warming process by the fireplace. It feels so, so good. See, the same things happens when you go into a hot tub as you come out of the pool. You imagine you get out of the pool, it's a little bit cold, and then you come into a nice hot tub and you go, oh yeah, baby, that's, that's nice. That's really, really nice. See, there are all kinds of examples we can use to explain the soothing effect or the ah uh, effect of something in our lives. Well, let me say this. The Word of God is exactly that and much, much more to our spiritual lives. Reading God's love letters to us is by far the most soothing effect for our spiritual man. When you receive the love, the joy, and peace of His Word, it can so easily replace any fireplace or hot tub out there. I mean, I want you to guys realize that those are physical things, but what's most important in your life are the spiritual things. And when you begin to get into the Word of God and read His Word and find out what it has for you and study His Word, meditate on His Word, you get that effect inside of your spirit and your soul and your mind and your heart. Everything tells you that God is real, that God is good, His love, His joy, and His peace is in you and working in and through you. Hallelujah. There is not a better feeling in the world. So the blessing derived from receiving and meditating on the Word of God is basically beyond description to the reader. Everybody receives the Word of God in a special, special way. Listen, Meditating on the Word of God brings you to a place of up close and personal with Him. That's what it does. It brings you to that place of up close and personal because you've decided, I'm putting away all this stuff and I'm going to get into His Word. I can read a novel if I want. I can read a story about this, a story about that, but I choose to read God's Word and I choose to meditate on it and listen to it and let it do its work in my heart. Now, that is the most precious thing that your body can receive. Hallelujah. And that closeness is the same and yet different with each person. It, it all has the same soothing effect, but differently to each person. Because of who God is, in all of his qualities and ability to deal with everyone on a personal basis, we can all have our own special personal relationship with him. See, God favors no one over another, ever. Hey, listen, I'm God's favorite, and so are you. You got to see it that way. So basically, everybody's his favorite. Awesome. Awesome. And that's what the Word of God makes you feel like. You are his favorite. That's why I want to look at the psalm, because it deals with all these things. The series we're starting is the treasures of psalms, and one of them is repentance. And there's nothing like repentance. There's nothing like turning away from the ungodly, things of this world, things that are not eternal, and switching over and receiving that which comes from the Bible, from the Word of God, with that which is eternal. Hallelujah. There's nothing like it. When you think about it from a biblical perspective, life 
was originally created to be simple, to be good and enjoyable. Life is everything and life is God. Hallelujah. Life is a blessing of God. You see, sin was never supposed to walk side by side with us like some sort of partnership. But because of sin and disobedience, life can be at times complicated simply because of that. Every day living in a fallen world can take its toll on many of us. But life is not complicated when you love God, obey God, and meditate on the things he said in his word. See, his word is like that hot tub effect it has on our soul and spirit. You know, when you walk in that hot tub, ah, when you read his word, it's the same thing. It's like, oh man, God, I feel so good. You just ministered to me by your word. Hallelujah. You just encouraged me by your word. You made me joyful because of your word. I feel blessed because of your word. It's like going on vacation, even if it's just for a few minutes. You know, listen, I'm not knocking a good and well-deserved time off from work and go and unwind somewhere, you know, somewhere warm and sunny. That's all good. But let me say this. Many times, what a believer really needs in most of their lives is to take a trip in God's word. That's what they need to do. Shut off all distractions around you. Forget everything that's been overwhelming you and just take a vacation into God's word. Hallelujah. You will be so much better for it. And you, when you're done your vacation, hallelujah, even if it's an hour or two, it's just taking a vacation from everything around you. Hallelujah. Take your Bible with you on your Sunday trip. Don't forget the word of God. See, God's word ain't no fantasy world. It's about as far from Disney as it gets. Now, taking a holiday into God's Word can be taken literally, or you can include it, like I said, on your travels. But let me say this. You should never leave the Word behind ever. Whether it's on your phone, on your computer, you bring your actual book, your Bible, bring something with you that you can just take time off and just read and just study. Just let God speak to you through His Word. Praise His name. Look at verse 2. It says, But His delight is in the law of the Lord. Hallelujah. And in his law, he meditates day and night. The book of Psalms is a compilation of several ancient collections of Hebrew songs and poetry for use in congregational worship, as well as in your own private devotion. So many modern day worship songs have their roots, their very roots in the book of Psalms. Too many to begin to count, really. Now, according to biblical scholars, the book of Psalms reflects the worship, the devotional life, and religious sentiments of approximately 1,000 years of Israel's history. Approximately half of them are attributed to David, and the rest of them, well, goes to Asaph, the sons of Korah, Solomon, Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Haggai, Zechariah, as well as a few others. And these psalms have a way to penetrate deep inside our hearts and our minds. They do. I've always encouraged people to take the time to read Psalm 119 because it's all about the excellencies of the Word of God. So it deals with every emotion. It opens up the heavens so you may begin to experience the grandeur of God and all of His creation. It exposes the inner turmoil and sin of our everyday weaknesses. It reveals the mercy and love of God and the power of His Word. Hallelujah. It reveals the beauty of His holiness. Praise His name. They are so power-packed. Let me tell you something. It is mind-boggling. Actually, anytime you read the Word of God, it is mind-boggling. But there's something special about the Psalms. I'll give an example. David. He just opens up his whole life in front of everybody before God and, and he writes everything down and it's just so beautiful to see Psalm 51 is a psalm of repentance when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and the guy was a, one of the greatest kings as a matter of fact he was probably the greatest king of Israel King David actually the throne of David is where Jesus is sitting on hallelujah he shall sit on the throne of David so David is priest prophet and king and so uh, he's a type of Christ. 
when he speaks from that personal place with God, he just opens up and he shows you his rottenness to the core. He tells you it's a great book. Hallelujah. And even just this psalm here, in the first two verses of the first psalm, you are already beginning to feel the spiritual pull to draw close to the Father. I'm just paraphrasing this part here. But blessed are you when you avoid the sinful things that tries to draw you away into perdition and receive the word of God daily as your spiritual sustenance, your daily bread. You are going to be blessed. I mean, that's what verse 1 is telling us here. And verse 2. So listen, look at verse 3 says. It says, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Now think about it. I worked in a forestry business. So a tree that is, that is on a river's edge has an edge over the other trees. And I'll explain that. It receives the right amount of water for the best growth results and i've seen that all for myself because i worked for a forest management company okay we used to cut wood we used to do the the boundary lines along the river's edge or on the lakes and the boundary lines for nobody to go across so that they won't cut into somebody else's property you only had so much to cut so i often saw that the nicest trees of a forest is where the drainage is now i remember one time i was walking with my my brother it was one of the first winter i worked there we were walking on the, the edge and we saw the nicest, biggest trees, but they were on a slope. They were all planted on the slopes going down towards the river. So what happens when it rains, they get the water, but they don't stay waterlogged. So they just get the right amount of water and they get the best growth too. So it simply means that the root system of the tree is not always in that state of being overwatered. Therefore, it promotes good growth. And that's what the Bible is talking to us about over here. God's word is similar. It gives us through its wisdom. See, the Bible is all wisdom. Everything in the Bible is wisdom. It gives us through his wisdom the right amount of water of the word for our spirits and for the renewing of our minds. And that's how we grow. You know, David experienced that at various times when he trusted and meditated on the law of Moses. Now, we don't follow the law of Moses because it's, it's a law that cannot be kept. Jesus came and he brought us grace and truth. Moses brought the law, sin and the law. The, the law reveals sin. It tells you what not to do because if you do that, it's sin against who God is. It's against the word of God. So the law reveals sin, but it's good. But we can't keep it because if we were to follow the law, for every little single thing, we wouldn't be able to do it. That's why Jesus came. That by his grace, when we fall, he picks us up. Our sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. It's not like having to slaughter animals. David, nevertheless, he meditated on the goodness of the law of God. So it's the same for us today. God's word works in our hearts as we receive and obey it. And that's the catch right there. We need to receive and obey it. You realize who you are in Christ, an uncondemned and free person that can experience the abundant life that comes from his word. It's that soothing massage, you know, after a day of trial and persecution. That's what the word does. That's what David's words that he wrote down by the Holy Spirit. That's what brings us into that place of experience, a closeness with God, an up-close and personal relationship. Hallelujah. And in that, we develop fruit in our lives that keeps on giving. The leaf shall not wither. Hallelujah. And it have its fruit in its season. Fruit that multiplies into more fruit. Everything about God is all about multiplication anyways. Everything begets something. So if you're always working in love and joy and peace... It's all going to come back to you in multiplied way. Hallelujah. You're going to live a life on this earth that is going to be so awesome. If you can live by the nine fruit of the Spirit, this verse talks about having its fruit in its season. It's all about multiplication. When the time comes for us to be fruity, the choice now becomes easy. Why? Because our roots are watered in the Word. And from that place of character comes more. Because fruit... Inaction begets more fruit. Isn't it wonderful? 
Hallelujah. You know, whatsoever you sow, that you shall also reap. It's the universal principle of God. See, the more you go, the more you grow. And in all of this, you prosper. And listen, prosperity begets prosperity. So it all works out. Hallelujah. But we got to go back to verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not, that or doesn't sit, or doesn't stand along with the ungodly. It's a separation. It's never ending, folks. The goodness of God, and it works for anybody. But for the unbeliever, it is not so. Their time is almost up unless they repent. Even so to the unbeliever who happens to do good. See, the blessings of doing good are a time-limited offer if you're an unbeliever. See, the blessings part at death, but the true believer in Christ continues on throughout eternity. Now, let me explain a bit of something here. You could be ungodly. That means you simply don't believe in God and you choose to do your own way. You're not linked up with God. You're not born again. You're not doing anything for God. But you're still doing good. You're still helping people. People need money. You're not afraid to lend things. And you're doing good. But you don't want to believe in God. You're going to be blessed. I've said this many times. You're going to be blessed while you're here on earth because it's a principle of God. So God can show you his goodness. But the thing is, once your time comes, and if you keep refusing Jesus, well, that's God's decision. We'll leave it at that. But the true believer in Christ continues on throughout eternity. Why? Because his sins are forgiven. Hallelujah. And he chose to make that separation. Although be it, it may not be perfect. We still choose to walk with Jesus. Hallelujah. Now listen to the last three verses. The ungodly are not so. We're talking about trees. Oh, we just finished talking about trees and fruit. The ungodly are not so. But they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand. And like I said, I will repeat that again. That means to take a stand, to be steadfast, to be established, be a servant of, like a soldier standing ready for a command. It works both ways. You can stand like that for the ungodly. But if you're a sinner, an ungodly sinner... In the day of judgment, you will not be able to stand. You won't have a leg to stand on. Nothing will be able to cause you to stand before God because your sins were not forgiven. You did not receive the forgiveness of sin. And it goes on to say, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. In other words, they won't be able to participate with us in the congregation of righteous. Verse 6, for the Lord knows. The Lord knows. He knows everything. I got to say that again because people feel somehow that the Lord only knows so much. Or Listen, he's God. He created your DNA. He created every single atom and everything that's sub-atom. He, he created every single thing. It's all his creation. He's the wisest God ever. There's only one true God. And he's the wisest. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Wow. What a warning about living your life outside of the transformative word of God. Think about that. I really want you guys to see today how important it is to immerse yourself into the word. To study his word. To understand it. And what better way really then either the book of John, like we're doing in our Bible study, or the book of Psalms, or the New Testament. It just actually, you know what, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all, all good. But I'm choosing today to start a series on, on the book of Psalms. They will have no future with God, the ungodly. Totally separated from Him in every sense of the word. I've said this many times before, but here on this earth right now, in the midst of all the evils that we have and in the midst of all the good and righteous stuff we have, the way the world is right now, the presence of God is still on the globe. It's still around. Hallelujah. It doesn't change. But it will at one point in time. Hallelujah. It will change. They will know the sense when God is not there no more. They will have no more light. Just utter darkness. No more goodness. Just pure evil for all eternity. Wow. That's enough to run to the altar if you ask me. That's enough to just drop to your knees right now. And say God forgive me. 
God, I receive you. I want to be on your side. I don't want to follow what's going on today anymore. Just forgive me of my sin, Lord God. Just touch my heart. I just want all of you, Lord God. That's what needs to happen. You see, this psalm teaches us about the very basic premise of life. There's life and there's death. Growing in Him or withering without Him, you choose. God's Word gets real, real quick. Psalm 1 should encourage a ministry of evangelism in the heart of every believer, really, if you think about it. And the last thing I want to say is that Psalm 1 is the open door to a beautiful experience into the Word of God. And in it are six verses that will change your life forever as you meditate upon them. You need to meditate on the Word of God, man. It's awesome. So starting today, I want to encourage you in the next few weeks to delve, to dive into the book of Psalms and let God reveal Himself in a way that you've never experienced. Okay, would you do that? Take some time in the book of Psalms. Thank you for being with us today. Hallelujah. And may the Lord richly bless you. And I hope to see you again next week. Praise his name. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you, Lord God, for your word. Because your word is awesome, Lord. It is life and life abundant, oh God. Hallelujah. Help us, Lord God, to turn away from that which is ungodly, that which is not from you, Lord God, and help us to turn toward you in everything, Lord, we do. That we would seek you for every single thing, Lord God. You don't get bored of that, Lord. You don't get tired of us coming to you. So, Lord, I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, if people are listening this morning that don't know you, I pray, Father God, that you would touch their hearts, oh God, that all they need to do is come to you, ask for forgiveness, ask to receive your son, Jesus, oh God, and, Lord, that they would just turn away from what they were doing and head towards you and begin to receive your word and your forgiveness in Jesus' name, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I want to thank you once again and have a great week. And I hope to see you next week. We'll look at Psalm 2. God bless.